TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher. Banned until when? When did I get unbanned? Was that was that today or yesterday? That was yesterday. Yesterday I got unbanned. They banned me and unbanned me so so much. It's all like a, it's all like a blur of being banned and unbanned. <laughs> uh, all right, so. It's me. I'm back. And with me now is, as we've discussed before, the equivalent of a man who spends his life documenting sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. He is Robert Spencer, who specializes in that mythical creature called Jihad. How are you doing, Robert? I am doing great, David. I've been watching a lot of people saying prayers, giving alms, being charitable and kind. That was their jihad, getting people to school on time, going to the gym. It's 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 very exciting, tracking jihad activity because you get to see so many people doing good works. All right, just uh, just checking here because Carm said no sound. Up, oh, she took the message back. I guess that was Carm not having her uh, not having her audio on. Everyone else got sound. Just just verify because I do occasionally have have problems like that. We good? We all good? Let us know if we do, in fact, have sound. Elle says she has sound. All right, I think we're, uh, think we're actually good. Um, wow. I guess our jihad is having sound. Um, <laughs> Robert, did you, know that, did you know that jihad is just this internal spiritual struggle? Did you know that? I have heard this, David. As yeah. a matter of fact, that is the true, correct meaning of jihad. It is a struggle to please Allah. And Allah being the all-benign creator of the universe and of all of us, jihad means benevolence. Jihad means magnanimity. Jihad means kindness, patting little birdies on the head. And, uh, yeah, so we've brought up many times here, we have the, uh, my, the uh, That's My Jihad campaign that was popular just a few years ago where Muslim organizations were posting... Uh, posting this on like the sides of buses. So if, if, if you don't actually know what jihad is, they're explaining to you what jihad is. And it's just this struggle um, to, to, to really get things done. It's a struggle to go to the gym. It's a struggle to, you know, hang out with your friends and stuff like that. It's a struggle to, to, to get your kids up in the morning. Everything is your own jihad because it is, a, you know, jihad means struggle. So they're saying that's my jihad. And, and so with that said, um, I ate fish a couple times this week and, uh, it's, it's like vegetables in that I don't like, I mean, I could, well, I could deal with fish if it's fried, like fried catfish or something like that. Catfish fried in peanut oil. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tear it up. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, regular healthy fish is, uh, I'm not a fan, but as you get older, you're supposed to start eating. Well, you're supposed to eat the stuff when you're younger, but then you get older and they tell you, you really have to start eating this stuff. So anyway, I've eaten fish a couple times this week. Anyway, that's my jihad. What's yours? Well, David, I've got a new book coming out. And so I'm starting the jihad of trying to get the word out about the new book. And that is, of course, always a struggle or jihad. And uh, the book, of course, as you know, is called The Critical Quran. It is a commentary on the entire Quran, not my commentary, but my collection of the words of Ibn Kathir, the Tafsir al Jalalai, Qurtubi, the, in other words, the primary Sunni commentators on the Quran, plus a new clear translation of the Quran. As you well know, of course, all too many translations of the Quran into English obfuscate rather than clarify the meanings of the passages quite intentionally whereas this Quran is a clear translation commentary to help people understand what is actually understood by mainstream Muslims about the various passages plus all sorts of goodies like variant readings I've even got a couple of Shiite uh, sur surahs in there and uh, all sorts of fascinating wonderful things of course everybody knows that the Quran is a garden of delights and nothing proves that more than the critical Quran. And so my jihad this week has been to begin to start the publicity about it. Well, Robert, we'll definitely have to discuss that uh, probably a little before it's officially available. 
but uh, it already sounds like uh, a, a, a an epic dumpster fire. I mean, you just said <laughs> you just talked about variants. You just you just talked about variants, and I've heard from Muslim apologists for decades now that there is not a single variant any any variant anywhere in the entire history of the text right. of the Quran. So one, you already made that up, and two, I'll just have a question <laughs> for you: When you translate verses like Surah four, verse thirty four. Are you going to give the true translation that it's, uh, you know, if she disobeys you or if you fear disobedience or rebellion or something like that, then you admonish her, banish her to a separate bed, and then tap her lightly with a toothbrush? Are you going to give the, the true tap her with a toothbrush translation? <laughs> you know, David, it's interesting you to say that about 434 in particular. Because for that verse, I provide 20 different translations, all done by Muslims, to show that beat her is actually the primary way that native speakers of Arabic who are scholars of Islam and the Quran have understood the passage. Hmm. Well, now I'm confused because <laughs> all the apologists and da'is are saying one thing and then people who actually read it in the Arabic are concluding something very very different all right well uh yeah we'll definitely have to check that out and and uh i'll point out all the many 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 other flaws in it uh that are totally going against what the dawagandists say and we know we can always trust what the dawagandists say but uh we didn't get a show last week because i was banned once again and uh, uh, hang on a little, little note people keep posting uh infidel here says david consider moving to rumble no no can do Rumble, it, Rumble actually has worse policy. I was on Rumble for a while. I was only on there for a couple months, but I, then I, Rumble has worse policies than YouTube. Rumble is, Rumble is bigger on shadow banning and so on, and on terminating stuff without warning, no appeal than YouTube. YouTube, at, you know, notice I, I still keep getting back on on YouTube, no matter how many times they ban me, because they do have this appeals process, and then you could even complain about their appeals. Rumble just bans you, and too bad. That's it. That, that's how the, that's what they do. So, hmm? I think Dr. Bill Warner was banned from Rumble unceremoniously without explanation, and uh, that just corroborates what you're saying about it. It's it's a shame that there's no reliable platform to talk about these issues honestly. But yeah, we'll... and see see on Rumble, I think what people hear is like you're free to talk about you know that disease that we're not allowed to mention or something like that. You're allowed to discuss that stuff more freely. But then they present themselves; they call themselves the free speech alternative. Uh, when you're talking about Bill Warner getting uh, uh, getting uh, his channel terminated, getting um, Rumble, yeah, and then. Uh, spin and remixes. I mean, this is a guy who just takes someone when they say something stupid and he remixes it into a song. Um, and he got terminated after a couple of those. And so it's, uh, guys, if that if that's what the platform is like when they're trying to get people to leave YouTube and come over, to, I, I, I can only imagine what they'd be down the road. Because guess what? Everyone says they're all about free speech at the beginning. That's what, that's what Facebook did. That's what Twitter did. That's what YouTube did. Until they get a monopoly or until they got billions of dollars of ad revenue coming in and suddenly they change and it's, hey, advertisers who are paying us money, you tell us what you want us to ban. So no can do on the uh, rumble there. All right, but uh, we have a lot of jihad to talk about, Robert. Unless yeah. nothing, unless nothing happened, but I actually saw, and I, 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 you know, I'm not following usually the the news of jihad from around the world, but I even saw some stories. So, you tell us yeah. what's happened over these past two weeks, if anything. I did. I didn't even actually go back the entire two weeks. Once I got 57 stories ready here, I thought that's probably going to be more than we get to. But there's been quite a lot of jihad while you were banned. And yeah, so, see, that's the thing. YouTube stops me, but the jihad don't stop. The jihad don't stop. The jihad don't stop. And I'll tell you something else. There's, there's, there's some jihad right there on the YouTube. And uh, it doesn't get stopped either. But that's another story. Uh, I, I often find, you know, it's, it's, it's a thing I've been doing at uh, Jihad Watch uh, last few months. And that is that I notice that sometimes I see this jihad preacher preaching this blood-curdling stuff, and he's on Middle East Media Research Institute, Memory. Mm -hmm. And I notice that Memory says, oh, they got it from a YouTube. And so I go to YouTube and find the original, and I post both. The YouTube 
original and the memory excerpt. And I've never heard of any of those guys getting banned. Mm -mm. No, in, in fact, uh, I mean, uh, AP and I j did a show on his channel just last night about this, where, of course, you, you know, have Ali Dawa openly calling for the public executions of ex-Muslims and saying he's going to be sitting there watching and so on. But we, we, we went through uh, a clip by, uh, well, we went through a couple of videos by Sheikh Asim al-Hakim, who's very popular, he has over a half a million followers on YouTube, he has tons of followers on Twitter. And he's saying, hey, our community, the Muslim global community, is too weak right now. Uh, but So we just sit back and keep teaching Islam, keep doing dawah. But in you know, 50 years or so, we have to be ready because that's when, that's when the, the Islamic government is going to command us to go out and wage what we call offensive jihad. And he's talking about, hey, we're not we're knocking on your door and we're giving you the option. You convert, you become a dimmy or and he even goes, he goes, you convert, you become the dimmy or <laughs> right. And he, so he's openly saying we're going to force you to convert or you're going to become a dimmy or we're going to kill you. And we're doing this to everyone in the world. He's free to recruit people to that movement on YouTube. But if I pointed out the irony, if when I say, hey, that's what Islam teaches, I get banned. So he's out, he's out, he's out recruiting. Yes, join me, join me. We're going to do this. This is what we're going to do. We're not strong enough now, but we're going to keep building up our strength. So we go on a global killing spree and kill everyone and subjugate everyone. And YouTube's like, great, we're, we're all about diversity here. <laughs> and I say, hey, don't go on that killing spree and don't, don't do what this guy said. Oh, how dare you, your bigotry, you have to be banned. We live in an insane world, man. We do. And, you know, I think that goes back, that goes back years because I remember... The Organization of Islamic Cooperation, about 15 years ago, they started their Islamophobia Observatory. And it was just basically a monthly publication about all the terrible Islamophobia. And I was getting in there all the time. And they would quote me saying various things that some imam said. And the, the, the OIC never got mad at the imam, and the imam never got in the Islamophobia Observatory. But I was always get in for quoting Robert Spencer says, fight those do, who do not believe. <laughs> Robert Spencer, it's right here on his website. He says, if your wife rebels, you can beat her into submission. We found, the, we found the quote on his website. <laughs> That's it, man. That's how it was. All I right. Still got that going. I don't know. I haven't checked in on it in the years. But anyway, uh, okay, a lot of jihad this week. Shall we start with the war? The Ukraine war, the, the, the uh, Russia-Ukraine war that we've discussed before, and I said it was not a jihad. The Mufti of Chechnya, Salak Meziev, has actually uh, contradicted me on that. And he says that the Chechens who go to Ukraine to fight with the Russians against the Ukrainians have gone to jihad. And he says those who fight there, they fight for the sake of the Quran for the sake of Allah, so that this dirt does not spread among us, meaning Western uh, values, Western civilization. They are at jihad. There is no doubt about that, said the Mufti Salak Meziev, the Mufti of Chechnya. Now, that's interesting because, of course, other Muslims are going to disagree with him. They have disagreed with him. But there are some who will say, well, if that is what he is saying, then even though this is not a struggle between Muslims, it's actually two infidel nations fighting each other, I can still gain the reward of paradise by going to fight there. And so it's actually him saying this, it's essentially a recruitment tool. Mm -hmm. And he's going to get some Muslims to go there to fight. And also there, the, the uh, Muslim leaders in Russia itself got together, had a conference, they issued a fatwa quoting the Quran to justify the Ukraine invasion. And they said that any Muslims who were killed there fighting for the Russians would be martyrs. That is, they would go to paradise, get the, the, get the virgins and all that. That's a good deal. <laughs> so wait a minute. So wait a minute. You're saying, <laughs> now, la ladies and gentlemen, I mean, keep in mind, keep in mind. So if you're, uh, according to Islam, you're supposed to obey your ruler no matter what. Uh, I'm talking about your 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 Muslim ruler, um, unless he just clearly says something that is incompatible, in which case he, he becomes uh, an apostate or a heretic or something like that. You're supposed to obey him. 
And so if he says, if your if your Muslim ruler says, yeah, uh, it's it's jihad to go and fight uh, in Ukraine or something like that, then you're good to go. But think about the absurdity of it, right? So it's, uh, hey, you go over there, fight in this war that has nothing to do with you so that you can spend eternity deflowering virgins in paradise. I mean, do you, do you not, do you really not understand how insane that sounds? That was, that was the offer that Muhammad made to his followers. Hey, you fight for me, do what I say, do exactly what I say, don't back down. And Allah guarantees you that you'll spend eternity deflowering virgins in paradise. And they go, what? Uh, deflowering virgins uh, uh, for, for eternity? Oh my goodness. How are we going to do it? He says, don't worry. Allah will give you a miraculous erection that never, your, 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 your penis will never go limp. Allah will give you a miraculously turbocharged penis so that you can spend all day, every day, deflowering virgins. They go, whoa, okay, look, Allah, what about a charge? <laughs> you, <laughs> guys, when someone comes along, when someone comes at you with something like that, you need to be like, wait a minute. <laughs> there sounds some, <laughs> something sounds a little off with this one. All right. But anyway, uh, it's working. I, I have video posted at Jihad Watch of uh, Chechen jihadis screaming Allahu Akbar as they are setting off rockets in Ukraine, firing at apartment buildings and so on. So uh, that's that's Chechnya and Ukraine and Russia. That's their that's jihad. It, that's their jihad. In France, an Islamic State plot to assassinate Emmanuel Macron was uncovered. And that is just part of all the ongoing jihad activity that we have in France. Let's see what else we have these last two weeks. Oh, this was an interesting story. This is a little bit tangential, but not too much. This woman from Algeria, living in France, she was convicted of racism, which is apparently actual, an actual crime in uh, France. And she said all these very rude things to uh, some black people. And sh what, th what is noteworthy about this is that she was convicted under hatred, hate speech laws. And as she was being escorted to prison, she shouted out, I am outraged. I am Algerian and you have judged me like a French woman. Mm. Shame on them. And, uh, of course, there's several levels to this. It's a very interesting statement. One is that she considers herself superior to the French women. <laughs> and that's where'd, the, where'd she get that idea? Well, maybe, David, <laughs> from chapter 3, verse 110 of the Quran, which says, you are the best of people uh, on the earth. And the unbelievers, of course, in chapter 98, verse 6, are the most vile of created beings. And so she's being, she's one of the best of people. She's being treated like the most vile of created beings. But also I think she shows an awareness that hate speech laws and all that have, are really designed to combat criticism of Islam and to silence people like you and me. They're not really for actual people who speak actual hate speech, such as this woman with all her racist statements. That's not for whom the laws were intended. And so she's outraged that the laws were applied against her. Uh, also in France, another mosque was shut down for six months for preaching jihad. And here again, I just don't think that's going to work. In six months plus one day, that mosque will reopen. And what is it going to do? Preach flowers and sunshine? It's going to preach what it preached before, because what it preached before was based on Islam. Also in France, a Muslim screaming Allahu Akbar attacked two transgender people with a knife. When the police arrived, he said, shoot me. I want to die as a martyr. I want to go to paradise. And we were just discussing why he wants to go to paradise in connection with the, you, the Chechens fighting in Ukraine for Russia. He wants to enjoy the virgins forever. Next door in Germany, quite a lot of jihad activity lately. We have an uh, interesting story about Abdal Rahman A. They never give the last name of these guys. So nice. Yeah. They, may, but may, maybe, it's, maybe it's Adolf, and that's why they want to do it. <laughs> In any case, uh, he stabbed three people, this fellow, Abdal Rahman, uh, on a passenger train in November. 
and it was immediately reported that he had, was mentally ill, which is, of course, something we hear often in connection with jihad attacks. However, in a strange plot twist that is quite unusual in this line, German authorities have actually admitted that this fellow is a jihadi huh. and not mentally ill at all, as was originally reported. I guess I guess that's I guess that's progress in a way. If they're finally, after all these years, reporting that that there are some people who actually huh. just kill because yeah. that's what their their ideology tells them to do. That's certainly true. That's what they've not wanted to admit all these years, and that's why they say so many of these guys are mentally ill. Another case, actually, just from today in Germany, another Muslim migrant stabbed three random men with a knife. And uh, this was in Mainz, Mainz in Germany. And the police announced that they were investigating to try to discover the motive. Because, of course, for them, jihad is everything that we were talking about before. Uh, losing weight, getting to church on time, whatever has nothing to do with violence, nothing to do with believers fighting unbelievers. And so the idea that jihad might have something to do with this fellow's motive just doesn't enter into their thinking. Mm -hmm. Strange, so strange stuff. A, a related story about that. Uh, another Muslim who stabbed people on a, on a, at random in Germany it was originally reported as being named Elias which is the Greek form of the name Elijah out of the Old Testament and is a very common name among Arab Christians. But it turns out now that he's going to trial that his name is not Elias at all. It's Muhammad. <laughs> That's just funny stuff. All yeah. right, guys. All right, guys. We just locked up. Uh, we just locked up 10 different people for uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, what are their names? Uh, they're all named Muhammad. Uh, what do we do? Um, well, we can't have Muhammad looking bad. He's the greatest <laughs> thing in history. Let's, uh, your, let's see, we'll call you Matthew and you're Mark and you're Luke and you're John and you'll be Paul and you'll be Peter and you'll be Jude. Um, anyone else we're missing? It's awesome stuff, man. Yep. Uh, several stories out of Germany, also in connection with the Ukraine-Russia conflict, and that is uh, in several accommodation, several places where uh, Ukrainian refugees are being held. There have been um, several very unfortunate incidents. In uh, Dusseldorf, a Muslim migrant raped a Ukrainian woman in an accommodation for Ukrainian refugees. In another one, the uh, a group of Muslim migrant students tried to rape fleeing Ukrainian women whom they referred to as Christian sluts. In another one, a group of Arab Muslim migrants tried to uh, break down the door of a place where Ukrainian women were staying, and then Somali Muslim migrants in the same place tried the same thing. Now, all these sexual assault and rape cases and attempted rape cases go back, of course, to the idea that is enshrined in chapter 33, verse 59 of the Quran that uh, a woman who, is, who should cover herself so that she's not molested with the unspoken corollary that if she is not covered, she may lawfully be molested. And, of course, then with the captives of the right hand being able to be taken for sexual use, as in chapter 4, verse 24 of the Quran and so many others. And so uh, it comes as no surprise that a recent survey found in Germany that most of the sex offenders are from Turkey, Afghanistan, and Syria. Now, of course, the report did not mention the golden thread that might tie together Turks, Afghans, and Syrians. Yeah, what could that be? I can't even that think of one. Possibly be. But of course, nobody discusses the fact that these behaviors are actually sanctioned and approved in the Quran. And that's why you have this kind of behavior. When people think something is morally acceptable, they're not going to hesitate to do it. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking. Turkey, Afghanistan, and Syria. I'm trying to think what the common thread is, but I'm looking. There's not even a letter in their names where they all have the same letter in their name. 
in, in yep. all three names. So I can't figure out what the what the common thread could be. Anyway, it was one of one of life's great mysteries. Maybe they all have blonde hair. I don't know. It's got to be something. Something. We'll figure it out one day. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, in Saudi Arabia, our friend Raif Badawi, who uh, of course is internationally famous imprisoned for 10 years for violating so-called Islamic values. He has been freed, but he's still banned from leaving the country. And so he, and and from using social media. How messed up is that? So uh, he is still stuck in Saudi Arabia. We can hope that eventually he'll be able to get out. You, you, you know what? You know what's you know what's you know what's messed up, Robert? <laughs> yeah. I just I just thought I just thought to myself, mm -hmm. wow, this guy, he just spent uh, he just spent all these years in prison he was lashed um he avoided the penalty for for apostasy which is death just by saying the shahada i said hey i'm still a muslim i'm still a muslim i just you know i've criticized a few things here and there um and so he spends all these years in prison his family had already fled to canada and you think finally he's out cool he could go be united with his family and we'll get to hear from this guy we'll get to hear uh what he went through and and this guy's probably just going to be going off on the people who did all this stuff to him lashed him and so on and then you find out he's not allowed to leave for 10 years and not allowed to post anything on social media so he's co totally silenced but as soon as i thought that in my head oh they've silenced him on social media what what barbarians and i was just like wait that's what they do to me every day right yeah. and they do it to, here in the united states they constantly ban me from social media like it's constant it, i mean it's it's endless so it, it's uh, yeah uh, I've said it before, maybe we're not as different from Saudi Arabia as we like to think over here. Oh, I think that's absolutely true, because another related story out of Saudi Arabia uh, that also got international attention is that they executed 81 people in one day for various crimes, including deviant beliefs. Now, of course, in the United, the United States, you're not executed for deviant beliefs, but you are silenced, as you have noted, on social media for beliefs that go against what YouTube thinks you ought to believe. And of course, I'm heavily shadow banned on Twitter, same thing, and various other places, because I don't say what the powers think are correct beliefs. In Saudi Arabia, in that 81, it's interesting to note that uh, 81 people were executed and the crown prince he has been criticized harshly for this because he was supposed to be reforming the country's very strict adherence to Sharia. And he said, look, it's clear teaching in the Quran that you can put people to death. And so uh, once again, we have a Muslim testifying that there is a uh, warrant for this kind of behavior in the Quran itself, when in the West we only hear that the Quran is entirely benign. One of the, uh, actually two of the people who were executed among these 81 were two brothers who killed their mother. And it's interesting to note that they killed her because she tried to stop them from joining ISIS. Hmm. Hmm. Now, that, I thought, that is worth noting because we have pointed this out in previous uh, shows, David, that if somebody is disobeying what a Muslim perceives to be the settled law of Allah, then they have made themselves an unbeliever and can be executed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you have, in this case, the woman says to her sons, don't join ISIS. They believe ISIS is the caliphate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the true uh, political group that every Muslim should belong to. Consequently, she set herself against Islam. She's an enemy of Allah and has to be killed. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Oh, I'm getting an echo now. Check, check, check. Okay, it's stopped. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh... It is weird how everyone who actually reads the Quran misunderstands it, and the only people who really understand it are people who don't read it and just listen to what politicians and journalists say. That is, there's never been a book like that. It is, it is truly amazing. But, uh, but we, well, I'd, ha I'd have to say, I mean, according to Islam, they're right. If I mean, if she's standing in, if she's standing against and pitting herself against the islamic state then she's the one who's in trouble and uh wild stuff similar story out of pakistan 
an 18 year old girl named uh, sorry let me get her name here Pooja Kamari she was uh, murdered she's a Hindu she was a Hindu girl and a Muslim tried to a Muslim named Wahid Bukslashari tried to kidnap her, forcibly convert her to Islam and marry her. And when she resisted, he murdered her. And this, of course, comes from the Quran, chapter two, verse two hundred and twenty-one: "Do not marry polytheistic women until they believe." So this Wahid Bukslashari did not think he could marry Puja Kumari until she converted to Islam. When she resisted, she also was making herself into an enemy of Allah and hence was lawfully to be killed because any reasonable person would not resist being forced to convert to Islam because all of us know in our heart of hearts that Islam is really true. This is the actual understanding that many Muslims have of non-Muslims, that we all know that it's true but perversely refuse to accept it for reasons of personal gain. And that belief goes back to various stories about Muhammad dealing with the Christians from Najran in southern Arabia. And they, on their way to meet him, they say, we know this guy's the prophet, but we can't tell, can't say that. We have to resist him because the Byzantines give us money and we don't want them to cut us off. And um, here's what's really disturbing about uh, the story of that Hindu woman, that if he had been successful, taken her somewhere, she would have been tortured into signing something saying that she had willingly converted to Islam. And then when anyone goes looking for her or anyone tries to intervene to investigate, it would be, nope, she signed something here saying that she has converted to Islam and now no one gets to question what happened but he didn't get to do it and so she died but if if he had been successful then that's the story we would have gotten she she decided to convert and, and marry this man indeed happened by the way ladies and gentlemen you wonder why we say that because we wonder why we're saying that because it happens all the time in pakistan you can walk up to any random woman uh, hindu woman or oh, hindu girl christian woman Christian girl, if you can successfully kidnap her, you take her, um, marry her off to some guy, and beat her until she signs something, and it's case closed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It happens so often. And then we've seen courts in Pakistan say, look, we have the document, and here she is. She says the document's authentic. She's converted of her own free will. Case closed. End of story. All right, uh, more out of Pakistan. Uh, in <clears throat> oh, here it is. The uh, recently the minis federal minister for civil aviation, uh, Khwaja Sarwar. He was addressing a public rally, and he said that he would like to become a suicide bomber to kill the enemies of Pakistan and Islam. Now this is kind of unusual because usually, I mean, you look at the video, this is a guy probably in his 60s, not your average demographic for a suicide bomber, but of course he knows that it's in the Quran that Allah promises paradise to those who kill and are killed. That's chapter 9 verse 111. So whether or not he actually becomes a suicide bomber or not, and I'm betting not, nonetheless he knows that this kind of thing plays to the audience that he wants to appeal to. Those are the values of the people that he wants to win over to whatever cause he may be advocating for. And so he knows that they know what's in the Quran and that consequently they will look upon him kindly for saying something like this. I mean, it, it sounds exactly like things Muhammad said. Muhammad said, uh, I just want to, I just want to be martyred and then come back to life and then they get martyred and then come back to life again and then they get martyred and then come back to life again and then get martyred. I just want to kill and die and come back and so I can kill some more and die again and come back so I can kill some more and die again and so on. And so and then as soon as someone says, Hey, I want to be martyred. I want to go on a killing spree. I want to blah, 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 blah. What? Where are you getting that idea? Uh, yeah. And, uh, 
it it did the whole thing the idea that this guy would say this it gives the lie once again to the western idea of what's in the quran and islam this is an educated man a power <coughs> excuse me a powerful and accomplished man somebody who clearly has read the Quran, knows what's in the Quran, and yet he says this anyway, uh, because that is in the Quran and not the flowers and sunshine that we are constantly told. Uh, okay, out of Egypt, a, uh, three, a terrible case, three Coptic Christians were brutally murdered by a group of six Muslims who were screaming Allahu Akbar as they murdered these three men and mutilated the bodies. <clears throat> and they said that this was revenge for the death of one of their family members from 1952. Now that's 70 years ago, and I don't have any way to verify whether or not that's true, but I do know that in the Quran, in chapter 5, verse 45, it says, we prescribe for them in it life for life and eye for eye, nose for nose and ear, ear for ear. And consequently, you can start a cycle of revenge that will never end because the both aggrieved parties read the same Quran and will consider that they have a right to avenge themselves against the other. And there's no corresponding. I mean, people will say, well, that eye for an eye business, that's in the Bible, too. Sure, but there's also forgiveness in the Bible. And while this passage in the Quran says whoever forgoes it, it will be expiation for him, that's a voluntary thing. And somebody might decide to go with the eye for eye, and then it could never end. And so it's entirely plausible that these people are working out a cycle of revenge that goes back to 1952, maybe even before that. Well. Wow. Okay, a lot of stories out of India and uh, the subcontinent in general. Did you? Uh, yes, sir. Did you see the Kashmir files? I have not had an opportunity to see it yet. I've got to see it. I've I've read so much about it, but I have not seen it yet. I caught it. Fantastic. How was it? Uh. Yeah, I'll make a review. Unfortunately, I'm going out of town uh, like late tonight, uh, so I won't be back until Friday night. So I'll post a review on Saturday. I do have some criticisms, but overall, I mean, it's a, it's a very well made movie and you see a lot of messed up stuff. And there was stuff in there. I'm thinking I'm sitting there going, there's no way that happened. And I would look up the, the actual story of what happened. And it's worse. What it's worse. Right. What actually what actually happened and so on. So anyway, some. Uh, yeah. Well, there was some uh, some stories connected with the movie, actually, out of India. Uh, there were uh, three Mus Muslims who stabbed three Hindus who were coming out of seeing the Kashmir files and were shouting slogans that uh, the Muslims took issue with, and they stabbed them. Uh, also in India, it was Holi, the, Indi the Hindu festival of colors, and there were quite a few incidents around that a mob kicking and beating Hindus for celebrating too close to a mosque, a mob stoning Hindus who were celebrating, and then the police showed up, and the Muslims stoned them as well. Uh, and uh, in an un unrelated, separate but related story, I should say, a uh, Hindu young man, 20 years old, was swimming in a well, and the Muslims thought that it was their well, and they murdered him. Because, of course, chapter 9, verse 28 of the Quran says the idolaters, the polytheists are unclean. And so the Muslims believed that he had contaminated their well. And consequently, they murdered him as a result. Bangladesh, there was also uh, an attack on a Hindu temple which was robbed and ransacked by a mob screaming Allahu Akbar just before Holi began. And uh, a Hindu in Bangladesh was arrested for criticizing Muhammad. Now, over here, they just close your YouTube channel, but he was arrested. And then a mob formed demanding exemplary punishment of him. Uh, because, of course, ex 
an example is exactly what they want to do to frighten people into thinking they cannot and must not say anything critical of Islam, not even close to being critical, because if they do, then they will be not only arrested, but lynched. Connection with that, in Pakistan, there was a film made called I'll Meet You There, starring a famous Pakistani actor, Kavi Khan. And uh, it was made by a filmmaker who wanted to make a film about Islamophobia. And it was banned in Pakistan for presenting a negative image of, of Muslims. So you have a film that's supposed to be about Islamophobia, and it's banned for presenting a negative image of Muslims. We saw this recently in the United States at the Sundance Film Festival with the banning of the, the, the apology, rather, for the film showing of the film Jihad Rehab, because even the idea that any Muslims could be terrorists and would need rehabilitation was just too Islamophobic for the Sundance Film Festival and for its followers. And in Pakistan, this film apparently had some negative portrayals of Muslims or some aspects of Islam. And so even though it was supposed to be attacking Islamophobia, it was banned. Well, that's a <clears throat> swing and a miss there. <laughs> All right, Nigeria. I'm going fast here because we're running out of time. Uh, always more jihad in Nigeria. 25-year-old man named Sharif Yongo. And he was a Christian on his way home from a convention of the Lutheran Church of Christ in Nigeria. And he was murdered on his way home. Uh, also, Father Joseph Akeke of St. John's Catholic Church in Kaduna City in Nigeria was kidnapped by a group of Muslims. And uh, while he was kidnapped, they murdered a security guard who worked at the church and uh, abducted also a woman and two children. Of course, the abductions are designed to bring ransoms. And unfortunately, uh, I don't know about the Nigerian government, but the, the Western governments play along with this far too often. And they have paid ransoms to Al-Qaeda and to ISIS for abductions in Islamic law. It is allowed. It's in Chapter 47, Chapter 8, around 67 and uh, 47 for various instructions regarding abducting, kidnapping people. And uh, 47 four says they can be enslaved, killed, freed outright or ransomed, depending on what is best for the Muslim community. So a lot of Western governments have given very great sums to jihad groups as ransoms. Mm -hmm. And is, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's, Never it's, it's disastrous, right? That's uh, Once you, you do it, you pay for it, you get more. Well, you, you get what you pay for. Yeah. Uh, by the way, you got a, you just got a greeting from Kaduna, Nigeria. So Hello, we, Kaduna. So we do have viewers in Kaduna, Nigeria. I love you all in Kaduna, Nigeria. Uh, let's go to Canada, David. This is an important story. A man holding an axe and pepper spray went into the mosque and he I heard that I heard this one and uh it, it wasn't didn't we have Trudeau and, and yes. all, all the other politicians I, I'm that dude Ford <laughs> that Ford dude and everyone's oh this is there's no place in Canada for this bigotry against Islam and then and then I recall some some additional details came out yes uh, it was a big Islamophobia case Canada had a terrible story a few years back of a young man who ran over and killed a Muslim family on the street. And that's a terrible case, obviously. A heinous crime, and the man should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it has been made the basis for a massive Islamophobia campaign in Canada. And there are groups that have, I believe, falsely claimed that Canada has some terrible Islamophobia problem, and that's why this happened. Yeah. And it yeah. has to be combated. And so they seized upon this incident at the mosque. Trudeau issued a statement. Uh, as you said, I strongly condemn this violence, which has no place in Canada. And they were using it as another instance of this terrible Canadian Islamophobia. Until 
the perpetrator was arrested. And his name is Mohammed Mois Omar. Huh. That's a... Apparently a member of the mosque who had a beef with some of the people inside. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, a couple issues here. Uh, one, I mean, aren't aren't Canadians, like, the most laid-back people in the world? <laughs> as far oh, as yeah. I can... I think they sit around all day drinking Tim Horton's coffee. I mean, that's, that's what they, that's what they do in Canada. There's literally nothing else to do, uh, in the entire country, except, uh, go to, except go to Tim Horton's and, and eat some, and drink some maple syrup. There's but, curling, David. Yeah. So, uh, but, but here's, here's the thing. And this is, this is amazing. You eventually get some either, either horribly evil person, or some insane nut job or something like that, but just he, he decides to go, he decides to run down some Muslims. And then it's because of that, we've, we've got this national problem that we need to look into and talk about all the time. When for the rest of the world, there can be Islamic terrorist attack after Islamic terrorist attack after Islamic terrorist attack after after Islamic terrorist. It doesn't matter. There are thousand. You you know there have been tens of thousands of them just since nine eleven. Every time we can come on, every time we come on here, you can talk. You can talk about fifty, sixty, or seventy of them. It's relentless, and yet we're assured there's never a problem, and only a racist and a bigot and a hate monger would even think about looking into the source of this problem so it's like my goodness and it sucks because as you see as you see there in canada it's most frequently an insanity among the leaders and among journalists right your average person walking down the street if you break that down say hey uh guy just ran his you know ran his 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 vehicle into some muslims that is, is do you think we should look into that do you think we should look into why he did that try to get to the bottom punish that guy but also look in to make sure that's just like you want to make sure that that's just that guy and he's not part of some group that has an ideology that actually promotes those kinds of attacks. Shouldn't we look into that? I go, yeah, of course. And then if you're talking to a regular person and you say, well, hey, if jihadis are all quoting this book and the commands actually sound like they're commanding what these guys are doing, don't you think we should look into that? Your average person says, yeah, of course you should. I mean, it's obvious. I mean, an idiot could understand that. But all, I mean, all the leaders, the politicians, uh, everyone who has a, 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 a place in the education system, whether in you know elementary school, whether in college, uh, Hollywood, everyone, everyone agrees. Nope, you are you're. There's something wrong with you if you think there's any problem with jihad. I got a story out out of that uh, about that actually, David, out of Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany, where. Uh, it has become a controversy now because a professor, Suzanne Schroeter, she uh, criticized the hijab and is now, of course, being denounced as a racist. And so uh, she herself has taken this a little uh, to another level and has said, look, any kind of criticism of Islam in Germany, in German universities, is not only banned, but is so stigmatized that it's tantamount. You want, you lose your job if you say anything critical about Islam. And that's not just in German universities, of course. That's true here as well. Also, in connection, you know, I was talking about the hostage situation before in Nigeria. And I should note, in connection with that, I was saying that jihad groups earn a lot of money by hostage taking. Also this week, the UK, the British government, gave Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, $515 million for three hostages. So there you go. Hostage taking is sanctioned in the Quran and in Islamic law, and it's a lucrative undertaking thanks to foolish and short-sighted infidels. Let's see what else we got here, David. Uh, there was some, oh yeah, there was a very important story out of Iraqi Kurdistan. And that was the story of a young woman named Iman Sami Magdid, who uh, was 20 years old, and she was something of a social media presence. And she 
posted a video of herself singing Christian hymns and announcing that she had converted to Christianity, whereupon she was summarily murdered by her brother and uncle. And, of course, with this goes back to the Quran, chapter 18, where Hidr, Moses' strange companion, kills the young boy, and Moses asks him why, and he says he was disobedient to Allah, and consequently his parents, who were pious, deserved a better child, and all the other sanctions for honor killing, as well as the death penalty for apostasy. Did you uh did you come across this story? I'm checking it out. Did you come across a story from Israel? Did you see that one? Yeah, I got several from Israel here. Yeah, which which one you? I got. Uh, I saw one. For, uh, I came across one today from a shopping mall. Yeah, the stabbing. The uh, I can't find. I have it open here, but I can't find which one it is. Oh, here it is. Yeah, uh, the stabbing of a Palestinian. Uh, Oh, no, that's not it either. There were so many that... Uh, I got become... this one. Beer, uh, this one says Beersheba terrorist caught... Yeah, that's it, uh, Beersheba. ...taught high school in Bedouin town. So this was a high school teacher. Yeah, uh, he stabbed four people to death. And uh, actually, he tried. He ran them down, ran down some, and then stabbed. He ultimately killed four people. And Hamas applauded it. And the one I have another one from Jerusalem... Same thing, really. Uh, a Muslim stabbed two cops. Hamas applauded it again, called it a heroic act. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just looking at the, uh, I'm just looking at the list here. So Iraq, Canada, Nigeria, Bangladesh, India, France, uh, Germany, Pakistan, Egypt. It's just, it's just everywhere. It's like every, every. It's it's every week. It's everywhere. New Zealand. I'll oh, give you one more since you're talking about places. Uh, in New Zealand, there is a 20-year-old Muslim who uh, openly threatened to kill non-Muslims in the city of Auckland. And uh, he has been ordered to undergo a mental health evaluation because, of course, here again, this is where we came in. Uh, authorities all too often think anybody who wants to go jihad is just crazy. And they, they don't understand or acknowledge the existence of the jihad imperative. Wow. It is literally <clears throat> everywhere. Everywhere that Islam is, there are, plenty of, there, are pl there are plenty of Muslims who don't do anything, but you always end up, you always end up with, uh, with jihad one way or another. Indeed. Well, everywhere people believe that Allah rewards violence against unbelievers. And where do they get the idea that Allah rewards violence against unbelievers? Hollywood. The Quran. Oh, the Quran. Oh, okay, the Quran. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you're, no, you're right, you're right, you're right, I'm wrong. You're wrong, I mean, you're right, I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, you know, Muhammad commits violence against unbelievers, the Quran exhorts violence against unbelievers, and then Muslims commit violence against unbelievers, and of course, it has nothing to do whatsoever with Islam. Yeah, the the ones who actually know what Muhammad taught and are willing to do it, they're the ones who misunderstand their religion. And we're told that the the true the true Muslims, the ones who know the true nature of Islam, those are our <laughs> nice friends who never do anything to us, our nice Muslim friends who never attack us and so on that we work with. And if you quote a verse to, they'll have no what no idea what you're talking about because they don't know what's in there. Um, and so once again, it's this, it's this really, really strange book where the more you read it, the less you understand it. And the less you read it, the more you know about it somehow. It's amazing. It's an amazing book to me that now, if, if I were, if I were to argue for a miracle in Islam, it would be that it would be that the, the more you, the more you read the book, the less you know about it, but the, the less you read it, the more you understand it. That that's a miracle. What a miraculous book! There it is. That's the best dawa. That's that sure is some good dawa. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, we all done for the week? I think that's about it. There's plenty more, really, but uh, it would take another hour. All right, so that's the jihad that we keep imagining. Uh, the problem is this, this jihad that we keep imagining actually keeps getting people killed. And that's the, that's the terrible thing. You know, if we were talking about the Loch Ness Monster and we were obsessed with Loch Ness Monster sightings and there's no Loch Ness Monster, but somehow this Loch Ness Monster kept slaughtering people all over the planet, everywhere. <laughs> you might want to start looking into whether that thing's real. You got a point. All right. Well, uh, everyone, if you want to stay up to date, if you want to stay up to date on Jihad, you have to go to Robert's uh, website every day to see the latest news. And that's what he that's that's what Robert does better than anyone else. Uh, so Robert Spencer on Jihad Watch and uh, the religion of peace dot com is also another good site that that keeps everyone updated on a daily basis. Also, if you want to really understand the history of Jihad, you, you have to get Robert's book, The History of Jihad. Uh, those links are in the description box. And we will very soon apparently be discussing your critical Quran. Uh, any final thoughts? There'll be more Jihad. That's all I can tell you. Yeah, sadly, sadly, sadly. More jihad and more Loch Ness monster sightings. But yes, the, the Loch Ness messy. Yeah, the Loch Ness monster sightings. On you know, well, fortunately, will not actually get anyone killed. But the uh, imaginary jihad will keep getting people killed. And uh, Carl here says, "Thank you, David, for taking the time to listen to Robert's delusions." <laughs> so, you're welcome, Carl, and you're welcome, everyone. We'll continue listening to Robert Spencer talk about all the delusions <laughs> that are getting people killed all over the world. Yes. Uh, until next time. Delusions. <laughs> Catch y'all later. <clears throat>